So the cephalosporin antibiotics. Now, the, uh, just as penicillin is, is an antibiotic obtained from a mold, the cephalosporins are antibiotics similarly obtained from a mold. The mold that they first obtained cephalosporin from was a mold growing near a sewer outlet off the coast of Sardinia. And they discovered this uh, mold, and that became the source of the cephalosporin antibiotics. The person who developed the cephalosporin antibiotics was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1965. Um, the cephalosporins are very, very similar to penicillins. If you take a look at page P27, this is showing the structure, the molecular structure of penicillin. Don't worry, I'm not asking you to draw it on a blank sheet of paper. When, when I look at this uh, penicillin, this is showing penicillin. So penicillin to me looks like a house with an attached garage. Does everybody see that? Looks like a house with an attached garage, and then it has these side chains. So when we talk about penicillin G, <laughs> penicillin G is basically this house, this attached garage, and this side chain. When they change that side chain to this, that's called penicillin D, and that's the one that's effective orally. This is the one that's given by injection. This is the one that uh, works uh, orally. And basically, the way they create all these other penicillins is by just modifying this uh, side chain that's attached to the attached garage. Now, if penicillin looks like a house with an attached garage and a side chain, then a cephalosporin, and I'm not asking you for the structure, but I'm just trying to make a point, a cephalosporin basically doesn't look like a five-sided uh, pentagon. It looks like a six-sided hexagon with an attached garage and a side chain. Its mechanism of action, its uses are very similar to that of penicillin. Structurally, it looks very similar. And just as they have modified the side chains of the penicillin to create different types of penicillin, they have modified the side chain of the cephalosporins to create different types of cephalosporins. All right, so that's the penicillin structure. This is a cephalosporin structure. So with that in mind, on page P9, so cephalosporins block bacterial cell wall synthesis and are bactericidal just like penicillins are. This is page P9. Cephalosporins have a spectrum of action similar to that of amoxicillin. So in fact, let me give you an example of a cephalosporin that I think some of you may have heard of. There's a cephalosporin called Keflex. Has anybody ever heard of Keflex? Most of the cephalosporins, their names, generic and brand name, either begin with the letter C or K. Anyhow. So Keflex is a cephalosporin that has a spectrum of action similar to amoxicillin. So it works like penicillin. It's bactericidal like penicillin. So then the question is, well, why is there any advantage of using cephalosporin over penicillin? And their answer is there are two. And what are the two advantages? It works against staph. Because the staph bacteria produce an enzyme called penicillinase. That breaks apart the penicillin molecule. Where penicillinase works is it breaks apart the house. But it doesn't break apart the cephalosporin because its structure is different. So therefore, cephalosporins like Keflex and c are commonly given when they, may, when they know they're dealing with staph. Now, the dentists don't usually use cephalosporins that much, but the physicians do. Because remember, a hospital is a breeding ground of nosocomial staph infections. So they're dealing with a lot of staph, so they need to use an antibiotic that works against all staph, and most penicillin doesn't work against staph. There's another advantage of cephalosporins over penicillins. Penicillins are among the most allergenic of all drugs. Uh, typically about 8% uh, of the U.S. population is allergic to penicillin, almost one out of every 10 people. Cephalosporins, very few people are allergic to cephalosporins. 
What's the possibility that if you're allergic to penicillin, like four of you are, that you are also allergic to a cephalosporin? Only 15% of those allergic to penicillin are also allergic to a cephalosporin. In other words, 85% of you cephalosporins are fine. So now we're dealing with a bactericidoantibiotic, which is the kind of antibiotic that's preferred rather than a bacteriostatic. I mentioned on page P10, cephalexin, which goes under a lot of brand names, including Keflex. It is commonly given for respiratory tract infections, skin infections, UTIs. Uh, it can be used, uh, again, part of the, if one's dealing with prophylaxis and bacterial endocarditis related to rheumatic heart disease, uh, it is an alternative to the penicillins. Because of its spectrum of action, it's fairly broad, you always have to worry about the development of opportunistic secondary infections. Uh, and just like penicillin is nephrotoxic, so is our cephalosporins. Now there are a whole bunch of these cephalosporins, and uh, they created, uh, they changed that side chain uh, of the cephalosporins, just like they changed the side chain on the penicillins, creating broader spectrum cephalosporins, just like they had created broader spectrum uh, penicillins. So they call these second generation and third generation cephalosporins. And an example of a second generation cephalosporin with a broader a spectrum of action is c -chlor. Has anybody ever heard of c -chlor? Yeah. c -chlor is commonly given to people with uh, otitis media, uh, middle ear infections, or sometimes for urinary tract infections. What it does, it, what it has over uh, Keflex is it's also effective against anaerobes, whereas Keflex wasn't. So uh, let me, uh, so that's why I wrote it's used for otitis media or middle ear infections. So let me uh, summarize this. Look on the previous page, P9. Keflex, a first generation cephalosporin, is basically used, it has a spectrum of action similar to that of amoxicillin. It has two advantages over amoxicillin. What were the two advantages? It works against staph and it is far fewer people are allergic to it than penicillin. And then here I wrote C-chlor. C-chlor is more like T-carcillin. It uh, works, it's effective against anaerobes as well as aerobic bacteria. And again, it has those two same, same two advantages over T-carcillin and penicillin. What are those two major advantages? It's effective against staph, and uh, far fewer people are allergic to it. Now, you would be right in saying if you add clavulanate, won't the penicillin work against staph? Yes, it will. But here you don't have to add anything else, just the antibiotic alone was eff is effective against most staph. On page P11, they have this even broader spectrum of cephalosporins called third generation cephalosporins introduced in the 1980s. I'm not going to really test you on it, just throwing it out there. Uh, it's not on our simplified chart, but what's on the simplified chart you should understand on page P9. But uh, there's a drug, a cephalosporin called Omnicep. You know what Omni means? Everything. It's a really broad spectrum. It's even effective against Pseudomonas, which is a very difficult bacteria to deal with. Now, if ph physicians especially like to use cephalosporins over penicillins. Dentists, when dentists are confronted with somebody who's allergic to penicillin, they tend, generally will prescribe an erythromycin. Most of you who are allergic to penicillin, you're used to getting erythromycin. Now again, erythromycin is a family of antibiotics. It's not just one, all of these are families. So uh, the most common erythromycin uh, prescribed today is called erythromycin E, or E-mycin. Now, erythromycin is not as effective, it is not as good of an antibiotic as either a penicillin or a cephalosporin. Why not? Because erythromycins are only bacteriostatic, not bactericidal. Again, if you've forgotten what that means, I review that concept on that introductory video, the same one where I talk about penicillins.
And erythromycin as mechanism of action is blocking microbial protein synthesis. It has a spectrum of action similar to penicillin G, but it's also effective against staph and mycoplasma infections. Anybody remember what a mycoplasma is? No? Yeah, very good. It's not a fungus. A mycoplasma is a ba very small intracellular uh, 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 bacteria, bacterium that's an intracellular parasite that has no bacterial cell wall. And so the reason why erythromycin is very appropriate for mycoplasma is because penicillin and cephalosporins, what's their mechanism of action? Both penicillin and cephalosporin interfere with a bacterial cell wall. Mycoplasma doesn't have a bacterial cell wall. So penicillin and cephalosporins, even though they're bactericidal and normally are a drug antibiotic of first choice, won't work against mycoplasma. Erythromycin blocks microbial protein synthesis. Erythromycin is primarily used as an alternative to penicillin in patients allergic to penicillin, meaning in most cases, it's an antibiotic of second choice, not an antibiotic of first choice. But it's used as a second choice if you're allergic to it. And frankly, if I were allergic to penicillin, I'm not. But if I were, I'd ask for a cephalosporin over erythromycin, because cephalosporins are bactericidal, not bacteriostatic. Now, you'll notice on page P12, erythromycins, the, however, are commonly prescribed for broad as a very broad spectrum antibiotic for respiratory tract infections. If you don't do a culture and somebody has a respiratory infection and you have no idea what the hell that, that infection is, erythromycin is not a bad choice. Because not only is erythromycin admittedly only bacteriostatic, but it will, is effective against pneumococcus, it's also effective against mycoplasma pneumoniae, whereas penicillin and cephalosporins won't work against a mycoplasma. It's also effective against Legionella pneumophilia, and penicillin and cephalosporins aren't, because they, they, they've been, the, again, the mechanism of action. It's also effective against chlamydiae, which uh, the penicillins and cephalosporins are not. Uh, it's also effective against Corine bacterium and Bordetella. All of these are respiratory infections. And so if somebody's dealing with uh, one of these or more of these uh, respiratory infections, and you really, you're not doing a culture, you have no idea what it is, this is a good broad-spectrum antibiotic to choose from. If you were to look on uh, page P13, I'm going to come back to P12 in just a moment, the erythromycins that I'm speaking of right now are known as erythromycin ethyl succinate, or EES. But uh, related to it, and many of you have heard of this, is azithromycin. goes under brand names Zithromax and Zmax. And clarithromycin goes under the brand name Biaxin. If you've heard of any of these, it's because you probably had a respiratory infection, and that's what you were prescribed. They are commonly prescribed for respiratory infections where you, the uh, infectious agent is not known. And it's got a broad spectrum, much broader than uh, penicillin and cephalosporins. Admittedly, only bacteriostatic, not bactericidal, but at least it works against chlamydia and Legionella. Going back to the previous page, P12, the major adverse reactions on page P12 of erythromycin is that they do tend to almost in everybody cause GI irritation, cramping, and diarrhea. I know every time I've ever taken an erythromycin for any purpose, I get really bad GI problems. And that's very, very common with erythromycin, more so than these other antibiotics. Back on page P13, so, um, Again, we mentioned Zithromax, Vioxin, especially for respiratory infections where the infectious agent has not been identified. There is a related antibiotic, an antibiotic related to erythromycin called clindamycin. It is a part of the uh, older uh, protocol when you're dealing with infectious endocarditis for somebody who is uh, allergic to penicillin.
uh, to use uh, clindamycin. Tetracycline. We've all heard that name, tetracycline. How did it get these antibiotics get that name? Because their molecular structure looks like this. It's made up of four rings. And therefore, it's called tetracycline, which means four rings. That's the shape of the tetracycline molecule. On page P14, tetracycline is in some ways similar to erythromycin. Like erythromycin, it is only bacteriostatic. Like erythromycin, its mode of action is by blocking microbial protein synthesis. So in other words, I'm trying to draw a parallel. Penicillins and cephalosporins are similar in their efficacy and their mode of action. Both are bactericidal and work by interfering with bacterial cell wall synthesis. And erythromycin and tetracyclines are similar. They're both bacteriostatic, only bacteriostatic, and they both work, their mode of action is by interfering with microbial protein synthesis. Both of them tend to also be very broad spectrum, tetracyclines especially. Now tetracyclines are always an antibiotic of second choice unless you're dealing with one of these weirdo uh, infectious agents like chlamydia or rickettsiae. So chlamydia and uh, rickettsiae in those few cases, tetracycline is the antibiotic of first choice. The other antibiotics don't work as effectively against them. Now, chlamydia is a cause of an STD. It's the third most common, uh, I think, uh, after gonorrhea and syphilis is chlamydia. Uh, but there's also another uh, form of chlamydia that can lead to a pneumonia-like infection of the uh, respiratory tract. Rickettsia are weird. Uh, infectious agents that you don't need to worry about. Now, relevant to you though, tetracycline, uh, first of all, can be used for dental infections. It is used in the treatment of periodontitis. The, uh, the context that you're familiar with is arrested, where you've heard of using a periodontal-like powder that's applied around the sulcus, right, uh, for periodontal infections. It is. Um, also used in the management of uh, aptus stomatitis, uh, along with a corticosteroid to reduce inflammation. And it's also sometimes used in the treatment of ANUD because of associated spirochete involvement. And tetracycline is effective against uh, spirochetes, albeit only uh, bacteriostatic. Um, incidentally, tetracycline has, is commonly used in the control of acne. It is effective against chlorine bacterium acnes, so a very common for people with acne to take tetracycline. Also relevant to you, of course, is that tetracycline tends to bind to divalent cations, such as calcium and aluminum and magnesium. So wherever you find these divalent metals, this antibiotic tends to bind or chelate to them. So for that reason, tetracycline accumulates in bone tissue, in the teeth. Uh, it accumulates in the salivary glands, where there's a lot of calcium and magnesium and so on. Uh, and uh, because of that, because it does bind, uh, that's why a tetracycline is contraindicated in being given to pregnant women or children, so as not to accumulate in developing bones and teeth. Um, among uh, tetracycline has a very long duration of action, a half-life of more than eight hours. So commonly, tetracycline is only uh, get taken once or twice a day, uh, whereas penicillins commonly have to be uh, taken multiple times a day. Uh, the common uh, adverse reactions is a GI irritation which is pretty common with most antibiotics. I've already mentioned erythromycin seems to be really bad at causing GI irritation, nausea, and diarrhea, but so can all these others. Uh, part of the reason for the, 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 uh, the, the nausea, the diarrhea, and so on is because they're so broad spectrum, they alter the natural bacterial flora of the GI tract, causing a change in the color and odor and bacterial content of the stool, as well as the digestive tract. And because they, these broad, very broad spectrum antibiotics, uh, like erythromycin and especially tetracycline, uh, do affect a lot, a lot of different bacteria, 
that always opens up the possibility of secondary opportunistic fungal infections. So you can get candidiasis when you're taking these very broad spectrum antibacterial antibiotics. Um, on page uh, P15, so uh, I want to remind you that candidiasis, can, is that how you say it? Candidiasis? Um, anyhow, uh, uh, can it include, can manifest itself not only as a vaginal infection, but a perineal infection around the anus, and of course, as glossitis, uh, oral thrush, and so on in the mouth. Uh, anyhow, here I remind you that tetracycline can lead to, by binding to calcium in bones and teeth, lead to enamel hypoplasia and tooth pigmentation. Now here's an interesting, uh, somewhat tangential subject. I, uh, all of you have heard of tetracycline uh, 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 accumulating in bone tissue. I think you may also have heard that fluoride can accumulate in bone tissue. Can you tell the difference between fluorosis and tetracycline stains? So tetracycline stains fluoresce under UV light, whereas fluoride stains, fluorosis, do not fluoresce. And it has to do with the reason why they fluoresce. Tetracycline is its ring shape, so it tends to cause glowing or fluorescence under UV light. So that's a good clinical distinction between those two problems. Um, tetracycline is an FDA pregnancy category D. There's only one step that's more stringent than that, and that's X. So basically, it is contraindicated to give tetracycline in pregnancy uh, during, uh, in children under the age of nine. Now, uh, there, again, there's a family of tetracyclines. Among the most common tetracyclines prescribed are doxycycline and minocycline. The, they claim, the manufacturers of these forms of tetracycline claim that they are better absorbed uh, 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 even when taken with dairy products, even when taken with milk, than are other forms of tetracycline. Normally, because tetracycline chelates or binds to calcium and other divalent cations, that's why usually when a tetracycline antibiotic is prescribed, you're instructed not to take it within a half hour or so of drinking milk or eating a dairy product, taking an antacid like Rolates, which is uh, uh, magnesium aluminum hydroxide. So those would all bind and interfere with its absorption into the bloodstream. But uh, these claim less uh, of that effect. Um, Arrestin uh, is used for scaling and root planing procedures with periodontitis, and uh, it's a form of tetracycline. So that's that polydry powder that's uh, inserted into the periodontal pocket. Um, on page uh, P16, because tetracycline has such a broad uh, a, a spectrum of action against many bacteria, and it tends to lead to opportunistic uh, candidiasis or, or fungal infections. So there's actually some products available, uh, preparations that combine the tetracycline with an antifungal drug to prevent opportunistic secondary uh, uh, fungal infections or yeast infections. So uh, an example of that is mistechlin F and acrostatin and so on. Uh, vancomycin uh, is a bactericidal like penicillin. Uh, it is part of the uh, uh, protocol associated with uh, prophylaxis of bac against bacterial endocarditis in people allergic to penicillin. But uh, we're not going to test you on vancomycin. I do want to speak really briefly about uh, ventraniazole. It goes under the popular black brand name Flagyl. So uh, Flagyl is it's a fairly toxic antibiotic, but it is used uh, in uh, periodontal infections. It is bactericidal against gram-negative anaerobes, anaerobic bacilli, including bacterioides, fusobacterium, bilinella, Peptococcus, and so uh, sometimes you're dealing with these kinds of anaerobic bacteria in periodontal disease. 
and so uh, flagell can be used. It does tend to cause dysgeusia. That's a good word to know. Dysgeusia means a funny metallic taste in the mouth. It does cause xerostomia, which we know that anytime you have a case study and it asks you about some drug, you have no idea what to say, and it asks, what are you worried about? A good guess is xerostomia, since it's such a common phenomenon. And it can cause some abnormalities in red and white blood cells. We won't worry about that. On, uh, on P17, I talk about sulfonamide antibiotics. I'm not going to present them. We're short on time. Uh, I don't think we have to worry about it. The sulfonamide antibiotics, which include Bactrim and Septra, are still used for two major things. They are still commonly used for urinary tract infections and for otitis media, middle ear infections or earaches. But uh, we're not going to worry about them. We'll test you on it. Um, on uh, P18, quinolone antibiotics. The quinolones include Cipro. Most of you have heard of Cipro. Cipro is a very important antibiotic for UTIs, urinary tract infections. Uh, and it has been used uh, not only against uh, UTIs that are very resistant, but also MRSA. Again, I'm not really going to test you on the quinolones like Cipro, but uh, just mentioning it uh, just as another category of antibiotic. Another category of antibiotic I'll just briefly mention, probably you should know something about this on P19, are the anti-tuberculosis antibiotics. And I think that it's important probably for you to know something about them. Because tuberculosis is still pretty prevalent here in Southern California. And you're working close up to patients. And it's spread as an aerosol from the mouth. So uh, it's probably worth knowing something about tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is, uh, is caused by uh, Mycobacterium tuberculae. It is a very difficult uh, bacteria to uh, knock out. So I think as most of you know, if you are identified, diagnosed as having tuberculosis, uh, either by chest x-ray or by a test, TB test. So you have to be on antibiotics for about 10 months. This is not, uh, you know, going on an antibiotic for a week or two weeks. This is 10 months, and you're usually on two or three antibiotics for much of that time. The most common one is isone, isoniazide, which is taken for 9 to 12 months. <clears throat> Uh, and then either it's taken with rifampin or pirazinamide, which is taken for the first two months. So uh, this is, uh, interferes with the bacterial cell wall of the uh, Mycobacterium tuberculae bacteria, and it is bactericidal. So as I wrote down here at the bottom, it is used either alone uh, in the prevention of TB, or it's used to treat those with a positive skin test or, uh, or in combination with uh, uh, other antibiotics uh, for TB. Uh, and then on page P21, antifungal drugs. A prototype of an antifungal drug is Nystatin. It goes under many brand names, including Mycostatin, Nilstat, Nystex, Candex, Candex is cute because it's effective against candida. And uh, it is uh, fungicidal. It disrupts the fungal cell wall. And a fungal cell wall is different than a bacterial cell wall, as you'll remember from oral path and uh, from micro and so on. So it's, it's different. They are specifically fung antifungal antibiotics, nice stat. So it is used against candida or manila. Uh, yeast infections against oral thrush, which is characterized by white patches in the oral cavity, known as stomatitis, and in terms of the tongue, glossitis. Uh, it is sometimes used in the treatment of angular chylitis, because sometimes angular chylitis is associated not only with inflammation, but also could be candida, uh, could be partly fungal combination. 
And uh, of course, uh, this is a focusing on the oral infections, but it, uh, obviously candida is the cause of uh, vaginal yeast infections and infant eczema. So the common rash that uh, infants get, and the reason why is when you use diaperine and all those wipes, they're very effective as antibacterial, but they're not very effective as antifungal. So when you knock off all the bacteria with that diaperine, you know, wipe, it allows for opportunistic secondary yeast infections. So you get uh, infant eczema. Fungal infections, including candidiasis, uh, uh, tend to be opportunistic. When patients are on broad spectrum antibacterial antibiotics, commonly that's when they have their opportunity to multiply because the normal competition with the bacteria has been eliminated. Uh, uh, also, patients on corticosteroids, which are, we know are immunosuppressant drugs, increase the probability of oral thrush and glossitis, stomatitis, these uh, opportunistic uh, fungal infections. Uh, patients uh, receiving chemotherapy. Uh, the chemotherapy associated with antineoplastic drugs uh, basically lowers not only the red blood cell count, but lowers the white blood cell count causing them to be immunocompromised and allowing opportunistic secondary uh, yeast infections. Patients with autoimmune diseases, uh, such as type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, that's juvenile onset, is an autoimmune disease. SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus. Anytime somebody has autoimmune diseases, they may have some be immunocompromised. Their immune system is not working like everybody else's. Patients who wear dentures are more likely to develop uh, these opportunistic fungal infections. Again, I assume that most of what I'm saying you've heard in other classes, and I hope I'm not saying anything different from what you've already heard. I hope that it just acts to uh, reinforce uh, what you've already heard. There is a, a drug uh, called Mycolog. We've mentioned it previously. It's a combination nystatin, which is antifungal, with triamcinolone, which is a glucocorticosteroid, like prednisone. This is used for angular chylitis, and where you may have both uh, inflam inflammation and non-infectious inflammation, which is best dealt with with a corticosteroid, but there may also be uh, some opportunistic uh, yeast in there, so that's why they put the nystatin. Or if not, if there even if there aren't yeast, it prevents uh, by using the triamcinolone, the corticosteroid, it prevents any yeast from starting to uh, uh, multiply there. On uh, page uh, P22, uh, I just listed a few other antifungal drugs: clotrimazole, uh, monostat. Diflucan. Again, I'm not asking you to know these names. I just we want to emphasize classes of medication. So today, so far, we've been talking about penicillins, and again, there's a video of that. Uh, cephalosporins like Keflex and Seclor. When are they used? What's their spectrum of action? Do they have any advantages? Any disadvantages? Erythromycin. Any advantages, any disadvantages? Tetracyclines, what are their uses? Any advantages, disadvantages? Uh, Anti-tubercular drugs like isoniazide and antifungal drugs like nystatin. And uh, when are they used? Here's the main one I want to emphasize on P24. On P24, I tried to summarize the more, more common oral problems and their treatment. Upper, the upper half of this chart are infectious uh, infections of the uh, mouth. So if you have herpes, herpes simplex, you need an antiviral drug like Zovirax, if they give anything. It doesn't do that much, but it helps a little. If you have Vincent's infection or ANUG, so you can use a, 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 antiseptic like chlorhexidine, you could use flagell, you could use penicillin D. If you have angular chylitis, all right, so the, the, that's commonly a combination of inflammation and uh, fungal infection, oral thrush. So they treat the uh, inflammation with a corticosteroid, like triamcinolone, 
and nystatin is your antifungal drug. Or oral thrush, so you use a nystatin, an antifungal antibiotic. Now, uh, all the uh, rest of these, below this line, these are inflama inflammations of the, uh, in the oral cavity. They are not infectious disorders, they're inflammatory. And when you have inflammation, you control them with a corticosteroid. 